everybody, I'm Lori Hernandez, and this is One Creative Mind. In all its forms, the creative arts can have a powerfully healing effect on people experiencing a variety of mental health challenges, everything from anxiety to post-traumatic stress to loneliness. Making art can help you become better in touch with difficult thoughts and feelings, help you make sense of those thoughts and feelings, and even make you feel more connected to yourself and to others. How does this work? Well, joining us today is Amy Jenny. She's a licensed clinical art therapist and executive director of the nonprofit Art in Common. Amy, it is so good to have you with us. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be wonderful. Viewers, feel free to post questions or comments in the chat section at any time. And if you know anyone who can benefit from the information in today's webcast, please share this video with them. So, Amy, you are a practicing artist. How did you come to understand the potential healing effects of the creative process on mental and emotional well-being? And why did you decide to pursue art therapy as a career path? So that is a great question. Um, when I was, I've always been an artist. I've always done artwork. And fortunately, I had parents who supported it when I was growing up. Um, they, didn't, they weren't supporting it to the point where they were like, become an artist. <laughs> Definitely go, you know, get a career they can make money in. But I found my way back to it uh, more recently, but uh, back in about 2016 or so, I left a really stressful corporate position and um, I was kind of searching for, you know, where I wanted to go next. And I started working with uh, in volunteering at a resettled refugee agency in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And um, they were like, what are your skills? And I said, I'm an, I'm an artist. I can, you know, put me to work. So they did. And so I started hosting these art workshops for uh, women who were recently resettled from different countries in Africa. Um, and everyone spoke a different language. And I was I spoke English and everyone spoke different tribal languages, Swahili, etc. So what I noticed was when we had these art workshops, so it had everyone around the table. Uh, they were, they were, we were laughing and we were like sharing and, but no one was speaking the same language. Like everyone was speaking. So I started to realize like art is the common thing here. Like this is the thing that's helping us to communicate. And, uh, over time working there, I started to actually see some trauma come up in the work that, um, you know, I, I was, I was not an art therapist at the time. I was interested in psychology, but I wasn't quite sure how to close the sessions. Um, kind of seeing like the stuff that was coming up, like I would see, you know, images of war and like bloodshed and things like that. And uh, it really compelled me to go to like think about how I could get the education. And that's why I became an art therapist. And that was back in uh, 2016, I believe so. Wow, that is incredible. I, I got just listening to that. With your clients, you employ a combination of art therapy and talk therapy. So what are some of the advantages provided by art therapy that go beyond the traditional benefits of talk therapy? So, um, so sometimes it's difficult uh, just with like with average client, you know, the clients who are maybe like a, um, people who don't don't have necessarily really deep um, you know issues that they're working on. I'm just talking about like generally when you're working with a client, it can be really hard to find the words to describe uh, maybe a trauma or some really uncomfortable things that they've been through. And uh, what I have found in art therapy is, so sometimes when we get stuck in a session, you know, and like nothing's coming up, we will move over to the art and I will have um, the client, you know, make a piece of artwork. Maybe it's a drawing with pastel or oils or pencils, or we'll do something with clay or paint. And uh, what starts to come up for them, it kind of steers the therapy process in a, in a new way that's unexpected. Sometimes images come up for them that surprise them and surprise me. Um, but it, it's like a whole other language and it accesses so many parts of our bodies that we don't necessarily access um, you know, through talking because we store so much somatically in our body depending on the stances you take, give or hear like the power pose, like that actually evokes a certain feeling. And the same thing, like if someone is in a fetal position that can evoke a certain feeling as well. Um, so with that in mind, you know, art and expressive arts kind of covers the whole range of uh, what, what you can tap into during a session. 
Yeah, I resonate with all of that. I remember there was one therapy session where I was talking about how anxious I was for a competition. And my therapist at the time had said, okay, well, you know, do you, do you do the same things that you do when you're sitting here and you're anxious? Do you rub your hands and kind of like get real small? I was like, yeah, of course. I'm I'm just trying to cope and self-soothe, you know? And he said, what would happen if you did the opposite? If you stopped fidgeting, if you planted your feet on the floor and if you put your hands on your hips, then you puffed your chest out and you put your chin up, what would that look like for you? And so I started getting the habit of competing and, and of learning about body language. And I, you mentioned that and I, I resonate with that. So That's I'm so awesome. glad to know that art therapy has a connection with that as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. So I understand, but why is creative expression a more gentle approach to healing from trauma? And how do you encourage people who might feel reluctant or hesitant to want to express themselves in this way? One of the reasons I like using expressive and arts therapy is um, because it we don't necessarily have to go there. So like if someone in front of me, um, someone in front of me is like creating a drawing and this, this happened recently. Um, they created a, you know, a drawing of themselves and they were having a lot of trouble articulating, you know, exactly what they felt like being in a room of people. And just by the illustration, like what they created, um, it was like an instant, like I got it. And then uh, she was able to really, you know, express to me like this, like this is physically what it feels like. And, you know, they had a big kind of cloud around the body. And um, so that so like so much is said in just that image. And they didn't have to go into, you know, that specific trauma or that specific uncomfortable situation to necessarily access it. And what I would tell people who might be hesitant to doing art therapy is as the as a therapist, like when I work with clients, I tell them like, we are meeting on equal levels. This is not like an old patriarchal, you know, I'm the therapist and I know, I know what's going on. Like, I don't analyze the work unless we like, that's what is being asked and the client interprets it. So in, they discover things in the work that they're like, oh my gosh, like, I didn't even realize that I, this was connected to this. And, you know, then we make the connections together. So it's like, I'm more like a guide in the sessions and always an equal partner. And I'm always trying to work myself out of a job. That's what I always tell people, because that's the goal, right? You know, you don't want to be in therapy forever, but I feel like sometimes art can help us get there a little faster. Love that. Love that so much. You said that the power, or you've said that the part of the power of the creative process is that it transcends language. Would you mind telling us about the larger communities that Art in Common has served and engaged? And how has your work and their needs changed during the COVID pandemic? Sure. Um, that, you know, that's something we have thought about as in our organization and also as, as an art therapist. We think about that a lot. So with Art in Common, um, we, we, you know, I started off serving moms, right, and um, who were resettled, and we kind of moved into serving their children. So little, like little ones up to like 18, 19, 20 year olds, so young adults, and they were really hungry for like an acculturated experience. And I was like, I love, I love like hosting stuff, and I love art, but what would be really cool uh, so we had like, we would have graffiti artists for a positive cause come up from this, from the city. And these are like some really cool, amazing artists. And, uh, so they would come up and we would fund it and we would bring all the, you know, a lot of the kids together. We have a whole day, um, sometimes two of creating like an 80 foot mural by it's like 80 foot wide by maybe 12 feet high. And it was all like honoring their home country. And that's something that I can show you later. But just being there, like you don't need to speak perfect English, you don't like it's all about teaching and receiving and we would like blast cool music and we would have, you know, burgers and dogs and stuff like that. And it was just an amazing day and it's something is created in those events that is um, really, really special and then it kind of like dissipates and everyone leaves, I think, with some of that and you like you don't know like where is that going to take you in the you know, in the world. Yeah. It sounds like it really reinforces how important community is. And it, it it's like a bridge to connection with others, you know, when words can't do enough justice. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Would you like to share some of your own works? 
with us now? I would love to. And so the work that I've been doing most recently is really big. It's maybe like six foot wide by six and a half feet tall. And they're all, um, they're descriptions of neurons, believe it or not. And I, I've been doing a lot of work like with collage and they're kind of like these abstract um, creations of neurons. Cause I love to think about like how the brain works. And I love to be able to explain that to the people I work with, cause that's how we create change, right? Starting from our amygdala and on. So, uh, one of the works that I'll show you is it's, it's called neuron one. And, um, it's just like a, a, a huge, big blue piece with the, with four neurons that are kind of connecting and, you know, they're just like these amazing pathways. And when we really think about how our, how our minds work, I mean, that's, that's where, like I said, the change can happen. Um, there's another piece that I did. It is, um, it's an equally large piece and it kind of has this floating head in it. And, um, I was thinking a lot about addiction and how addiction plays out in, our lives, like whether it's our family's lives or in, um, you know, you know, people who we work with. Um, I thought I was thinking a lot about how uh, it's such a confusing, uh, difficult, stigmatized, uh, you know, topic and how when we're if we have a loved one or we ourselves are dealing with it, how we have to kind of hold the space for this kind of ugly thing that is really can come in. But also, how do you hold how do you hold the uh, the beauty of the person, like all of the amazing things that are still in that person, even though that addiction can like be taking over and like wreaking havoc in a life, but it's, it's a lot, it's like dialectic. How do you hold those two things together and still move ahead? So that's the second piece. And then the third piece that I'll show you is another neuron one and it's, I call it a neuronal landscape. And it's, you know, some of these I take uh, pages the collage are from like old 1960s psychiatric texts and I kind of rip them up and put them in there. And sometimes I get old, like old school prescriptions off of um, like Etsy or something and create these landscapes. And so that's, that's the third one that I'll show you. And that again, is just thinking about how it's, um, we have this amazing landscape in our, in our, you know, happening in our minds and um, just trying to get a vision of what it looks like. And also helps me to teach. I love that so much. Yeah, I I do a lot of writing sessions with one of my friends just because we enjoy doing it together. And there was one time we had written this like scene slash chapter. And I just remember her saying, God, it feels like my neurons are dancing. This feels so good. And I have yet to stop thinking about it. So every time you mention neurons in art, I'm like, yes, yes, <laughs> you're right. And you should say it. <laughs> So collectively and individually, we've all been dealing with some pretty heavy stuff over the last few years on all fronts. But personally, what gives you hope? What gives me hope? I, uh, I think just working with people. I mean, working even just the people that I work with every day and um, the people, you know, the community events that we work on and we the people that we work with in those uh, scenarios. It's really just bringing the empathy, like you never know what someone's going through and just being able to connect with someone and be present for that moment. I mean, you, you see changes in yourself and in other people. I, there's, so, there's so much we can do just by being present with somebody else. And um, that's really what I come back to most of all. I, I love that. I know um, I, my mom is a social worker. And so art was a big thing for our, basically our entire family growing up. And she said, when I was little, I used to draw everything in yellow because it was my happy color. So love that. That's so cool. Awesome. <laughs> this conversation has been so wonderful. Amy, thank you so much for giving people new tools to help them in all the various way, ways that they're in need of healing. And thank you so much for joining us today. I have genuinely enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Viewers, thank you too. For more information about Art in Common, visit www.artincommon.org. Now, for a quick look at one of the many mental health apps on the market, I spoke earlier with our team at One Mind Cyber Guide. Joining me now is Dr. Stephen Schuler, the executive director of One Mind Cyber Guide. Stephen, thank you so much for being here to chat about Wobot. I love the name, by the way. It's a very cute little robot, too. 
I just, I already feel like this instinct to take care of it, you know? First off, what is CBT? So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's a science-backed solution um, that helps treat a variety of different mental health issues. It's been found to be useful for depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, psychosis. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most researched and most science-backed solution we have for mental health concerns. Wow. Now, what is a chatbot and how is CBT delivered that way? So a chatbot is a software program that you can connect with or type to in free text and it'll respond back to you. So it's like your text messaging or messaging um, a friend of yours, but what Wobot does is it comes back to you with different content or advice based on cognitive behavioral therapy. So it teaches you different skills to examine your own thought processes and um, look at them more realistically to help you get what you want out of life. That's pretty cool. I like the sound of that. It's really useful. Oh my, yeah, it, I, I really do believe so. Who might this type of therapy be helpful for and how? So as I mentioned, cognitive behavioral therapy has been effect, found effective for a variety of mental health conditions. But I'll also note that the skills of cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful for anyone. All of us could use some benefit in getting more separation from the negative thinking patterns that get us down sometimes, or learning some more skills to be more effective in pursuing our goals and what we get what we want out of life. And so, you know, Wobot is not just for individuals who are experiencing mental health challenges, but can also teach us skills that can help us get more out of life. How long does someone need to use this app and how often? So typically in cognitive behavioral therapy, we actually see some pretty meaningful benefits very early on in engaging in these types of um, programs. So I would say you'd likely see some sort of change start you know, two to four weeks after using the app. Um, really, I think that the people who benefit the most from these apps use them a couple different times a week. So maybe like think about trying to check in, if not on a daily basis, maybe three to five times per week, because it really is trying to teach you some skills that you want to then go apply to your life. So you don't want to just download it and then leave it on your phone. You want to make sure you check in on that little robot on a regular basis. Is there anything else that users should know about Wobot? So I'd say it's important to remember, although Wobot is a shown to be an effective intervention and useful at teaching the skills of cognitive behavioral therapy, it's not a replacement for therapy. And so it, it can be a useful on-ramp to teach the skills or reinforce the skills. But if you find that you're not getting the most out of it, I do think connecting with a trained mental health professional um, is a good next step. And finally, how about the cost? So Wobot is actually available for free. And so you can go download Wobot from the app stores and really try it out and start learning some of these practices of cognitive behavioral therapy yourself. The CyberGuide website is a great online resource to find out all about the many mental health apps that are on the market. How do you rate each app and what is the criteria? So we rate apps by having members of our review team use the app and look for different um, aspects of the quality of application. We look at aspects of credibility. Um, is there evidence to support that this app works? We look at user experience. Is it easy to learn and easy to use? And we look at transparency around data security and privacy practices. Do they tell you what they do with your data if you enter into the app? And Wobot scores quite well on these scores at One Mind Cyber Guide. So it's one of our highest scoring apps, in fact. It gets five out of five on our credibility score, a 4.64 out of five on user experience, and acceptable on transparency around data security and privacy practices. Incredible. Stephen, thank you so much. And viewers, thank you too. For more details and information, visit onemindcyberguide.org. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. I'm living my best life.